Okay, thank you everyone for joining today's Kativ Virtual Academy. Today we have a special guest from ANSYS. We have Mark Horner here today, and he's going to be talking about an introduction to computational modeling and medical device development. Thank you guys again all for joining today, and I'm going to hand it over to Mark. Thanks, Christina. Appreciate it. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, nice to uh, see everyone here today. Let me share my screen quickly. So yeah, as Chris, oh, let's take a look at this poll. So is this the final results of the poll, Christina? Yes. Okay, so what we see is, um, yeah, I wasn't allowed to vote. What we see is that is your company using computational modeling and simulation? 100%, that's awesome. So I'm like preaching to the choir maybe. Um, is your company using CMS as part of regulatory submissions? Wow, that, oh no, oh wow. Okay, sorry, I just went default to yes, okay. And then, are you familiar with the ASME BMV40 standard? Um, we do have one person out there. Well, not one, because there's obviously more than uh, 10 people here. Um, but we have some folks out there who are familiar. But in general, that's not the case. So that's really nice to see. So um, I think what's great then is that we will, um, and yeah, I apologize. I just defaulted to the answer I wanted to see even at the top. So is your company using modeling simulation for our product development? Also a no. So yeah, we have a lot of great content to talk about today, and then hopefully an opportunity for you all to learn more about how modeling and simulation is currently used in the medical device space, and the opportunity not only to use uh, computational modeling and simulation as part of your uh, product development internally, but then using that evidence externally with regulators. We have a huge opportunity right now in the industry to do that, and I'll just you know give a brief introduction to that today. You know, within a 30-minute time window, we can at least dip our toes into the water learn a little bit about that opportunity. If you are interested in learning more about the details that I talk about today, especially as related to the ASME BMV40 standard, um, feel free to reach out to me. We are organizing uh, throughout the year, things like workshops, trainings, et cetera. In fact, I'm doing a training next week at the Virtual Physiological Human Conference in Portugal. Um, and that's a four hour training. So we're trying to be more proactive and organize more and more of those um, throughout the year. I'm currently going to speak with someone um, uh, in a couple of weeks about holding trainings during the Design and Medical Devices Conference that takes place in Minneapolis every year. Um, so hopefully we're getting that on the book. So, um, you know, hopefully there's more opportunities coming along for you to learn more. Okay, so with that then, let's get started. So Mark Horner and as Christina mentioned, distinguished engineer working at ANSYS. I've been at ANSYS now over 20 years um, and always focusing on healthcare, both medical devices as well as pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical applications and modeling. Um, I started off as a support engineer, um, worked my way up to consulting, and now you know, kind of, I, I'm in this kind of business and technology development role here. So for me, I spend a lot of my time now, as you'll see in, as part of today's presentation, talking about uh, regulatory applications and modeling. I do some work in clinical applications and then also digital transformation. You'll see a little flavor of all that throughout today's talk. So as an agenda, I'll give a little bit of an uh, introduction to the healthcare industry and motivate the need for modeling and simulation in healthcare. Um, as you can guess, talk a little bit about the regulatory update, what's the FDA position on modeling and simulation, and then give a little insight into this ASME BMV40 standard. Again, uh, I put in the abstract, we talk about a few applications of modeling and simulation in healthcare. So I do have a few case studies to talk about, then we'll conclude and do a Q&A. Okay, so here at ANSYS, we subdivide the healthcare market into four verticals. Um, medical devices, medical supplies and hospital equipment, pharma and biopharma applications and modeling, and then physiological and clinical applications. And of course, you're just seeing a, a, you know, a, a cross-section of some of the ways that modeling and simulation is obviously used within these verticals. Blood pumps, I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Um, mechanical analysis of stents, uh, orthopedic implants. And you know what's interesting with the orthopedic implant example is that you know, instead of kind of using an idealized uh, representation of human anatomy, like you see with the stent, where you kind of have an idealized uh, artery here, you know, we can incorporate, you know, that patient-specific data. So in this case, it's a little hard to see the shadow, but that's a femur. And so we're looking at that integration between the implant and the femur and trying to predict performance. Um, medical supplies and hospital equipment, a lot of, we do a lot of work in the imaging space. And I also have an example about that uh, as part of my case studies at the end, uh, looking at the interaction between, I'm sorry, uh, I hope, hopefully there aren't some timings in here that I'm messing up, but um, uh, some, you know, looking at MRI coils and their interaction with the human body, peristaltic pumps is another example. This is a multi-physics example. We're coupling the structural analysis, in this case, the compression of the tube 
with the induced fluid flow as that pin moves and, and circulates around and compresses that tube. And then looking at things like uh, 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 kink testing of catheters. In the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical space, we do the upstream processing, looking at mixing. And that's, as Christina mentioned, the topic for next week by one of the engineers from Kativ. Um, but we also do a lot of work uh, in the downstream processing. So using FEA to model tablet compaction and getting an understanding of the stresses that develop as you, you know, compress powder within a dye. Where do those uh, stresses form? And will they uh, uh, somehow uh, compromise the integrity of a tablet? Also spray drying, so this is like a purification step for drugs after they come out of the mixing tank. And then physiological and clinical applications of modeling is a really exciting space right now um, where we're looking at you know, surgical support, clinical decision-making, surgical planning, et cetera. Um, and really, you know, one of the really cool things I heard recently was uh, someone was giving a talk about some work they're doing in modeling and simulation in the surgical space. And what they had said was that by the time a surgeon uh, does a procedure, that should be their third time performing that, that complex procedure, whatever it might be. Once they do a simulation, you know, using something like ANSYS technology, the second time, maybe uh, do an additive manufacturing representation of that patient's anatomy and practice with the surgical tools on that uh, additive print. And then finally, when they see the patient, no surprises. We have now are encountering our patient for the third time, and we're really, truly ready um, to do this procedure. So I think it's a really exciting time when you think about, you know, kind of the surprise, here's our patient today and what we're gonna do versus now what we're able to do with modeling and simulation and additive manufacturing to really bring more um, confidence uh, to the surgeon as well as the patient. Um, quite a few different uh, partners that we have within the healthcare industry. This slide's a little bit out of date. I mean, the idea is really just give you an idea of some of the companies we're working with. Um, you know, at ANSYS specifically, we're working with, you know, top 50 healthcare companies, you know, most of those, probably this number's gone up. You know, working with all the top cardiovascular and orthopedic companies, uh, we do a lot of work in imaging, you know, especially MRI, but also in CT scanners as well. Uh, we work with pharmaceutical and biotech, you know, a lot of the upstream, downstream processing, as well as drug delivery. Um, we also have a startup program at ANSYS. So if there's ever uh, any folks on the phone today from a startup and say, hey, you know, I just don't, gosh, I really apologize. I, I we just don't have the money, you know, maybe to access this technology. What else do you offer? We do have a startup program that can help enable startups to get going with simulation. And then finally, we have an academic partnership program where we really count on academics um, to hopefully do some of those more complex problems that we just don't have time to solve ourselves and our customers maybe haven't taken on yet um, to help understand things like how do I model fluid structure interaction and, you know, the, 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 how a heart valve might perform inside the human body and other, you know, complex scenarios like that. Um, you know, coming back to the four verticals, let's talk a little bit about key business initiatives. And so I don't want to go through each of these individually, but what I will say overall is that, you know, you can bubble out a few themes from some of the key business initiatives that we have in healthcare. One is obviously profit, prof profitability. You know, we want to use modeling and simulation to help drive innovation, make innovation faster, um, either cheaper or, you know, improve the productivity of our R&D. So we get our products out as quickly as possible. Another area though on the profitability side is maybe we can make a better product and differentiate ourselves and get more of that market share. Um, the second one is in accelerating regulatory approval through modeling and simulation. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And then the third one is you know, this kind of idea now that we're going to, uh, we're transitioning within the healthcare industry from you know, this kind of one size fits all approach to more outcomes based or personalized medicine. And so you know, traditionally you know, going back you know, pretty far, you know, things like hip implants, stents, et cetera, they were designed such that the population had to fit the implant. I mean, the companies would do their best to try and design implants that would fit the population as well as possible. But now more and more what we're doing is going to an approach where the implant fits the population. That could be uh, done a couple of different ways. One is custom implants, we see a lot of that. But another way if you, that's maybe more scalable is to get more information about, you know, what is the variation in size, for example, of our leg bone, right? And if we can get a real good understanding of that from medical imaging data, we can start to figure out what an average leg bone looks like and what's a plus and minus one standard deviation leg bone look like, et cetera, and start to build our implants that fit into those populations. And in fact, orthopedic companies are doing that uh, pretty regularly now. Um, another reason we wanna go to personalized medicine though is that we wanna transition as well, and I'm sure you've heard about this from what you know, folks call a sick care system really, to one that promotes healthcare patients. And you know, to be able to do that, what we need to do is be more proactive in the therapies we deliver to patients, but then also have more confidence in the outcomes of those therapies. And if we wanna have confidence in the outcome, 
that we need a model, right? And this is where we see a big opportunity for modeling and simulation to make a big difference in, um, you know, the, med the in healthcare space overall. One of the challenges we face, though, is that the medical device industry is built on these traditional sources of evidence uh, for establishing the safety and efficacy of medical devices. And this is both within companies and then externally when we go to regulators. Um, those three sources of evidence are bench testing, animal testing, clinical trials. Everybody in medical device industries knows these inside and out. And because the medical device industry is so heavily reliant on these three sources of evidence, the regulatory agencies around the world have essentially built their regulatory review processes around these as well. So while computational modeling, you know, they, brings a lot of value, we're the new kid on the block and we really have to establish ourselves, you know, as a trusted source of evidence and establish the, the regulatory frameworks and possibilities to make that happen. Um, one, what, one reason you might ask yourself though is why, why should we do that? And so one of the things that we're recognizing now, and this comes from a paper that was published by some FDA scientists back in the journal Medical Devices in 2017, we're recognizing that all of these are models and they all are, have their own representation of reality. So animal testing is one representation of reality. Bench test is another model. It's another representation of reality. Cl clinical trials are another representation of reality and then computer modeling simulation as well. And so, you know, let's take one for an example. Let's look at, you know, predicting clinical outcomes relative to patients. Bench testing, not so great at that. Animal testing, we're getting a little bit closer, but of course, clinical trials is really going to help us to understand how our devices are going to perform in patients. That, the same thing goes for predicting in vivo performance of patients. Meanwhile, if we want to maintain experimental, okay, if we want to maintain experimental control, um, you know, Bench testing and computer modeling allow us to do that because in that case, you know, we have very uh, tight control over those bench tests, and the, especially the computer models and the parameterization that we can do. And so that brings another form of, uh, you know, another, another way to look at the device that you're developing and how it will ultimately perform in the real world. So bench testing, you know, testing allows us to do maybe a more rigorous approach than we could get with a clinical trial. And so this is a really nice slide then as FDA was coming to this realization that modeling and simulation is really an important piece of the pie, you know, in terms of evidence that we need to consider. And so what they did is a little bit of an investigation a few years back looking at, you know, where is modeling and simulation currently used within the total product lifecycle of medical device? And they see that in the invention and prototyping phase. They see that as well in areas like post-market monitoring. So if we're looking at redesigns going from generation N to generation N plus one of a product, or doing root cause analysis because we have like a kappa or a recall, modeling and simulation is used very heavily. Um, they also see modeling and simulation used in these other spaces as well, but as you can imagine, in the preclinical and clinical, not, not so much yet. Meanwhile, what we're really trying to support and work on is enabling the use of modeling and simulation within the regulatory decision-making process and you know, trying to see what needs to be done to help support that. And so uh, in 2011, you know, what, when we really got that signal from FDA that, hey, modeling and simulation might be something that could be used as part of our uh, submissions. Um, this, this, this article was something that was sent to me. So it was published like MDDI, if I remember correctly. And someone I knew at the FDA was working with it at the time sent me this and said, hey, Mark, you're gonna love this. You know? And so um, this is an announcement made by the deputy director for science at FDA, Bill Mazel. And what he said is that at FDA, we've been looking at computational modeling as a fourth pillar of pre-market evaluation. So, you know, I mentioned before how bench testing, animal testing, clinical trial, those are the three traditional sources of evidence, three pillars, three legs of the stool for device evaluation, digital evidence, modeling simulation could be another component of that. But, you know, there's another really important sentence there. If we have high quality models, we can help better devices to be developed more quickly. So, you know, we have to have trust in the models that we're developing. That's a key element of this. And so FDA immediately published a couple of white papers that talked about regulatory science and FDA CRH, and they mentioned modeling and simulation as one of those key sources of evidence. And they also established modeling and simulation as a strategic priority. Um, this statement here was in that strategic priority plan, CDRH will expand computer modeling and simula simulation efforts to support regulatory science. These same words have been in their strategic priority, regulatory, regulatory science priority, whatever you call it, they kind of changed the names over the years. But those exact same words have appeared in that CDRH strategic plan or regulatory science priority ever since 2012 when that document was published. And so, you know, it brings us, if we look at that last statement again, so we say, hey, you know, thank you, uh, Deputy Director Bill Maisel, for mentioning modeling simulation as a potential source of evidence, but we know we need these high quality models. We need, and essentially what we're referring to is validation. So the question then becomes one of what is the evidentiary bar for digital evidence? 
how do we establish trust in this essentially what's a test method, right? So, you know, as a method developer within the medical device industry, we're developing methods all the time to evaluate medical devices. Oftentimes they're on the bench, but now we're developing these new methods that are on the computer. And so how do we ensure trust in those? Trust that we ourselves as modelers can trust those, uh, you know, those tests as well as our, our uh, colleagues, you know, within our group, the program manager who's helping us to develop a device who says, yep, I actually am able to trust what you're saying. I understand now. But then if we go externally, how do we, uh, you know, translate that trust out to the FDA? And so the, there's a standard called the ASME VMV40 standard. This group started back in 2011, I, if I remember correctly. I think I went to one of the first meetings, which was in 2011. And so um, that was when we first got together as a group trying to identify what are we going to do as a team? You know, what, what can we do as a contribution to the medical device industry in terms of verification and validation? And so um, what we finally landed on after a number of years of working is, you know, we went through kind of a, a gap analysis and tried to figure out what's out there. And one of the things we saw was that, hey, ASME already has these great standards uh, that talk about verification and validation for finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics and heat transfer. There are a lot of texts out there that talk about modeling and simulation and, or, and how to you know, validate models. One thing that's missing though is a structured discussion around how much is enough? When do I stop validating this model? You know, I could spend the rest of my life making one parameter better, um, but you know, when we come, in, come out into the commercial world, we don't have a lifetime to do that. We're trying to save patients, we're trying to get a job done. We have a finite amount of time. And frankly, we're using modeling simulation to try and decrease the amount of time that we're taking to you know, get devices to market. So we're not gonna spend our entire lives on this. How do we decide that a model is good enough? And how do we make a plan that gets us to that point? And that's essentially what the ASME VMV40 standard does. It's a step-by-step -step process that takes you through a, a, a series of you know, steps that help that inter essentially get you to lay out on a piece of paper, you know, here's what the question I wanna answer with my computational model. Here's the evidence I'm going to use to answer that question. Here's the risk associated with that uh, approach that I plan to take. And based on that risk, here are my credibility goals. Here's how much work I'm going to have to do to validate my computational model. So that's kind of what we do. I only have a few slides to talk about this today. If you do want to learn more, I think there's a couple of recorded webinars that I could put in the chat if someone wants to check those out. Um, or like I said before, um, you're always welcome to uh, join upcoming trainings. So VMV40, what's it all about? So um, we start off with this question of interest. And so the question of interest describes a specific question, decision, or concern that's being addressed. And typically that question is not, does my device work? You know, that's not what we're asking. You know, we might be asking something about an auto injector and saying, you know, what's the break loose extrusion force of that auto injector, right? So that BLE force, or uh, we're looking at a blood pump and saying, what are my HQ curves? You know, my pressure flow curves for that uh, blood pump. And, you know, we're looking at it as a function of the, you know, the spin rate, the RPM of the um, impeller. How does this perform and will it meet that clinical need? Um, the next step then, once we've identified our question of interest is context of use, which defines a specific role and scope of the computational model used to inform that decision in the question of interest. But we call it context of use because it's in the context of potentially other evidence. So we're gonna use a model, presumably, because we're doing this VMV40 thing, we're gonna use a model to answer that question of interest. But there might be other information there as well. We might be doing some bench testing or animal testing, or we have some clinical trial work that we're doing. So the model may not be answering this question in isolation. It may be helping to answer the question with other evidence. And so we need to lay that out very clearly when we're developing our plan. The next step then is to assess the model risk. Okay, so we, we've defined our question of interest and our context of use, and now we have to figure out what's the risk associated with using the model as part of our product development. And so we have two factors that feed into model risk. One is model influence, and as you can imagine, based on the word, you know, it's the contribution of the computational model to the decision relative to the other available evidence. So if this little blue piece of the pie here represents the in silico portion, how much modeling we're going to do relative to other um, you know, sources of evidence that we have from left to right, the blue piece of the pie gets bigger, you know? And I guess if I was smarter, I'd make like the yellow, I'd make this blue piece of pie yellow and turn it sideways to look like a Pac-Man, that'd be more fun. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, left to right, we're doing model influence. Now, decision consequence is the significance of an adverse outcome resulting from an incorrect decision. So in this case, imagine we have a, um, you know, reflux tester. Now, I already told you that, you know, just the device by itself and does my device work is typically not a question you have. But definitely what we're seeing within the industry is that 
you know, the, the, the class uh, of a device, class one, two, or three, definitely translates somewhat into that decision consequence. You know, typically if you have a class one device and you're just filing and notifying FDA that, you know, I'm putting this thing out there, you're probably not going to have a high decision consequence decision or a high risk to the patient because class one devices just don't go there, you know? Um, so anyway, just for a thought experiment, we'll put the, uh, whatever question we're asking about the reflex tester down here. And then we have a centrifugal pump up here. And so we're going to put that up higher. That's a higher risk. So now we're going to you know, move the model influence up uh, horizontally and decision consequence across vertically. We're going to bring these together. Now for the reflex test, we're going to rely pretty heavily on modeling and simulation. And so you can see where that kind of overall risk fits in. Whereas you know, we're not relying very much on modeling and simulation for our blood pump. We have a lot of other things we're going to do. We're going to test the pump on animals. You know, eventually we're going to get to a clinical trial. Um, and we also have bench testing. You know, and in this case, for whatever question we have, that's going to help answer our question of interest. And so what you see, though, is that even though we're relying very little on modeling simulation, especially relative to the reflux tester, our overall risk is higher, you know. So it's a smaller piece of the pie, but still the credibility requirements associated with that model are going to be higher because essentially in this case, the decision consequence, the patient is higher. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And now the translation of that into our credibility goals. So if we have higher risk models, as I just mentioned, then we're gonna to have to do more work to validate that model. So how do we figure out what work we're gonna to have to do and how much of it we're going to have to do? And so what we did to answer that question was come up with what we call credibility goals within the BNB40 standard. So what we did was took the constituent elements of verification, about, or sorry, the, the, these kind of uh, categories of verification, validation, uncertainty, quantification, and then applicability. We broke those up into their constituent elements. We call those credibility factors. So for example, we take uh, code verification. So then code verification, we have two credibility factors, software quality assurance and numerical code verification. So in this case, you know, what's the quality assurance processes that are around uh, developing the software? Is the company commercial or it could be an in-house code? You know, how is that code developed? Are they following code best practices, that kind of stuff? And then um, numerical code verification, what that speaks to is, is the code working as advertised? So, so through NCV, the whole goal is uh, to identify any potential bugs that are in the source code that might be impacting your solution. Um, so if you're modeling flow in a pipe, the point there is that while there could be a bug in turbulent flow, if you're only modeling laminar flow, then that bug doesn't matter because it's not affecting your solution. So you, for numerical code verification, because a lot of people get caught up in this, just because there's a bug over here, doesn't mean you can't use it over there, right? For your application. But you just have to establish through NCV that whatever uh, elements of the code that you're using are working correctly, okay? So then there's also calculation verification. The big focus here is like mesh refinement studies. Um, okay, so that's our verification piece. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because we're going to run out of time. Next, we go into validation. Okay, so for validation, then we're gonna define things like our model form and our model inputs. And essentially these are all the equations we're solving and the inputs associated with those equations. That's how we broke it up within the standard. Now, the other thing we talk about uh, within the standard is what's called a comparator. And the reason we have that is because, um, and, and then you know, essentially that's the testing you're going to do to validate the model. And the, the key takeaway from this uh, that you have to remember is there is no such thing as validation without something to compare to. If you're not comparing your model results against something, then you have not validated that model, okay? Just, that's something that's really important to remember. Okay, and then finally assessment. So, you know, how, you know, you have some input parameters and output comparisons that you're performing with your validated model. We're making sure that, you know, between the computational model and the comparator, we wanna understand how similar or different those are. And then finally, applicability talks about now that we've developed our model, how are the quantities of interest you're extracting from the model? How relevant are they to the original question of interest that you're trying to do? And, and the, also the validation activities themselves to the context of use, okay? And so the whole idea is that, you know, again, just think about it this way, is that the higher risk you are in terms of the risk profile, uh, you know, low, medium, or high, the higher you go, the more work you're going to have to do within each of these categories. Hopefully that makes sense. And so the whole idea then is you're, by going through these first four steps, you come up with a modeling and simulation plan, right? So you establish that plan based on all of these, and then you, you potentially have a review step in there where internally you say, okay, I've established it, we've reviewed it, everybody agrees, let's move forward with that plan, you execute the plan. Um, I didn't put a slide on this, but the next step then is you just assess credibility, is that computational model credible? And so we have a little figure within the BME 40 standard that shows how to do that. If yes, great, we document it. If no, you go back. And there are things you can do 
um, to potentially enhance your model if you decide it's not credible, it's not good enough. Um, some of those go back things could be, well, I'm going to change my context of view. So I mentioned before that maybe you have additional sources of evidence that are going to help you answer the question of interest. What if it's at the start, you say, I'm only going to have the model answer the question of interest, nothing else. You know, you might decide, okay, well, my model's not good enough. I'm going to start doing a little bit of bench testing or something to help answer that question of interest because we do see value in the model. So there are other things you can do to address that. And that's all uh, um, outlined within the standard itself. So we do have now, you know, especially here within the United States, and we're working to scale this out globally, a regulatory framework for modeling and simulation. It starts with the ASME VMV40 standard, uh, and that tells us how much VMV do we have to do. And I can't stress enough even that um, this standard is FDA recognized. So FDA did see the value of the work that we did. FDA helped to lead the development of the standard. And so um, it is an FDA recognized standard, important note. Um, then when we want to carry out those VMV studies, that's the ASME VMV 10, 10.1, and 20 standards, which cover FEA and CFD. And then finally, um, the last step in this is reporting your model. So how do we summarize our model and translate that information to the FDA? If we want to use that in a submission, there's a guidance document that was published by the FDA back in 2016 called Reporting of Computational Modeling Studies and Device Submissions. And what they provided there was essentially a, what they called a computational modeling and simulation outline. They said, fill out these different elements of the outline. If you do this, then that should contain all the information we need to review your model and provide you feedback. Maybe we accept the model because you were able to fill out all that information. Or if there were some missing elements or maybe just we need a little more information there, the back and forth communication between the FDA will be a lot less versus what was going on before this standard was released where um, you know, the, the, the style of the reports they were getting were very different. The information contained in those reports are very different. There's a lot of like um, missing information, especially uh, within these reports. So FDA was trying to get more predictability and consistency in the review of modeling and simulation and submissions through that standard or through that guidance document. Um, so if we can remember this and take this home to our, you know, to our groups internally and our teams internally and talk to them about, hey, how do we implement this ourselves? This, this is the big take home statement from this section. Okay, um, so you might say, okay, are people really doing this? Does this work, right? And so there was a really nice story that was shared by Medtronic at uh, Avicenna Alliance event in the EU Parliament. So the Avicenna Alliance, if you haven't heard of them, is a, a consortium of um, academia as well as industry based out of Europe. And so their goal is to promote in silico medicine. And one of the things they did in 2018 was to hold uh, a session around modeling and simulation and the benefits for the medical device industry at the EU Parliament. So this is actually attended by parliamentarians. And so one of the things that Medtronic shared as part of their presentation was this case study. And what they talked about was through the use of an engineering model and modeling and simulation, they were actually able to reduce the number of patients involved in a clinical trial by 256. Through that, they reduced the cost of the clinical trial by 10 million bucks because every patient costs $40,000 each to be in the trial. The product eventually came out two years earlier than expected because they were able to get to the clinical endpoint as uh, earlier than they expected, thanks to the model. And then finally, during that two years, we had 10,000 patients that were treated in that next generation therapy. So now we're going from, you know, we're getting to new technology sooner and helping patients sooner and a lot of patients, thanks to, in part, modeling and simulation. So really powerful take-home study in terms of the opportunity, you know, for modeling simulation, what it can do. Okay. I um, also want to mention that, you know, we have seen uh, within industry companies that are struggling with setting up a process around the VMV40 standard. What do we do? How do we establish a, a process? And what we're seeing is that in industry, folks are kind of falling back on Word or PowerPoint or something else to kind of fill out some of the stuff and they kind of create a little template or something, and then they fill all that out. And there's a lot of reporting that goes into it and essentially weeks of time are spent, you know, kind of just getting caught up in the documentation piece. And I think we're all on the phone familiar with documentation, how much time you can spend. To address that, um, what we did here at ANSYS was to create a web-based template that takes you through the VMB40 process step by step. And so this is based on our uh, Minerva environment that we have at ANSYS. It's a web-based platform that's used for uh, what we call simulation process and data management. Essentially, it's a PLM tool for simulation that also plugs into your PLM platform. And so through this, then, what you're able to do is uh, essentially create a one-stop shop for all the regulatory compliance information you need for modeling and simulation data. And beyond that, because it's a data management tool, even the modeling and simulation files themselves can be uploaded into this platform 
and tracked with the traceability that you want for these regulatory grade type modeling and simulation projects. And so it brings a number of different benefits. One is visibility. So now you have visibility throughout the organization. Um, if you're working with different engineers in different locations, now we can share those models, we can share work tasks, et cetera. But also because we're gonna use modeling simulation as part of our submissions, now quality and regulatory have insight into the modeling and simulation work that's being done. Um, so then you get that traceability and visibility around the, the digital evidence that you're creating. And so we think it's really exciting. This is just a screenshot that we're bringing from that BNB 40 workflow. And it's really what we're trying to do is take you through, as you can see, step by step, all the different processes associated with modeling and simulation for these regulatory grade projects. And as I mentioned a couple slides back then, it brings in a lot of other benefits because we're using this kind of enterprise platform for our modeling and simulation work where it then enables collaboration across groups, across teams, et cetera. We have dashboards that tell us the status of various projects. You can file work requests and track the status of those tasks. We can integrate into PLM. We can automate report generation. We have audit trails and traceability around the modeling and simulation work. Um, we're also storing our simulation data, but we can also uh, you know, get access to tools directly from the platform. And those tools aren't necessarily limited to ANSYS. So even though it is an ANSYS product that we're selling, we want, to, we want to be open. We know a product like this is meant for all simulations within your organization, and therefore it needs to be compatible with those. So any other simulation platforms that you're using, that data can also be uploaded. We can call those simulation platforms from the tool, et cetera. So it really brings a lot of benefit if you're looking to make that transition into a more, you know, um, a, a more, uh, you know, a quality, I'm trying to think of the right word, you know, a more controlled process around modeling and simulation, especially when it's going to move up into the regulatory world. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a few examples and then I'll close. So one that's near and near, near to my heart anyway is blood pumps. I did a lot of work back in my consulting days on centrifugal pumps. And so the goal of these pumps, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, is you know you have blood that's coming in uh, from one side and it leaves the other side and it's going to leave it a higher pressure and ideally at a pressure that's high enough to get that blood circulating throughout the entire body. And we use these to offload chambers of the heart depending on the type of pump, or sometimes we're really looking at a total artificial heart. And so because we're interacting with blood, blood cells themselves can be very sensitive um, uh, you know, to the shear environment within the pump. So we do a lot of work analyzing the shear and the impact of that shear environment on the red blood, some red blood cells themselves. One of the side effects that can occur when you have extensive shear acting on red blood cells is something called hemolysis. So essentially the red blood cell, if it's sheared for long enough, it can form little holes in the membrane of the red blood cell and then the contents on the inside leak out. And that means your hemoglobin, which is what's supposed to transport oxygen to your tissues and bring CO2 back, is now not as effective because we don't have that concentration gradient of a high amount of hemoglobin inside the blood cell. Now it's just kind of floating around the outside and it doesn't work as well. And so we have models and ways to predict the interaction between that shear environment and the red blood cells. So we can really go beyond the flow, which is great. And you know these kind of flow analyses here give us an understanding of macroscopic things like the HQ curve and the pump performance overall but we can also dig into that shear environment and start to understand what are those hot spots in shear? Can we mitigate those a little bit in the hopes of reducing the impact of shear on the red blood cells and potential hemolysis? And so here's a really nice uh, quote that came from John Wu at LaunchPoint Technologies. Essentially what he talked about is how he could reduce his design optimization cycle from years using trial and error to just several months using fluid dynamics. So really powerful in terms of, you know, what you can accomplish with modeling and simulation. MRI safety is another one. Um, so this is not an area, I'm a chemical engineer by training, so it's not an area where I do the work myself, but you know, we have gotten very involved in this area over the last 10 to 15 years um, because uh, essentially now we have uh, the FDA when they uh, started to promote the use of modeling and simulation more and more, excuse me, within regulatory submissions, this was already, already an area where modeling and simulation was being used. It was kind of formally slash informally. And so that, that, uh, that recognition grew very rapidly early on as FDA started to uh, see the importance of modeling and simulation. Um, so essentially, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, MRI coil is an electromagnetic environment, right? It generates a radio frequency field as well as a magnetic field. And the issues that we have, uh, and the reason you have to take all the metal off if you go to get an MRI, is that the radio frequency, the metal, uh, if you're wearing that metal inside an RF coil, that metal acts like an antenna, just like your, your car antenna trap, you know, traps that radio frequency signal and brings the signal into our cars. 
The same thing happens with an MRI coil. So you have to take all your rings and necklaces and all this stuff off, belt buckles, all that before you go in to get an MRI. The problem is now, what if we have a metal implant? That patient can't take it off, right? We can't remove that. You know, if we have maybe an external wearable, we can, but something like a hip implant, pacemaker, defibrillator, all of those are a problem. And, and so the concern is, you know, that antenna inside your body can focus that RF field around the tissue adjacent to the hip implant and then lead, and because it's focusing that field, there's heating of that tissue. And if that heating lasts long enough, it can permanently damage the tissue. And so um, many of the orthopedic companies, uh, cardiovascular companies, et cetera, are working very hard to make MRI safe devices, and this is why. And that's what it's, is meant by MRI safety. Um, so, you know, we can model that. So we have, the, uh, we have you know, um, we have developed models of MRI coils like 1.5T and 3T MRI coils. And then we can insert a human body model. So we have a repository of human body models that, that are sold as an app on the ANZUS app store. You can insert your implant into that human body model, place that inside the MRI coil and do essentially an electrothermal analysis. So you start off with the electrical step and model you know, how much heating, or sorry, you're gonna model what's called SAR, so the absorption of energy by human tissue. And then we're gonna pass that SAR calculation over into ANSYS Mechanical, do a heating uh, uh, simulation over time to figure out how much heating is occurring and try and predict you know, whether or not these devices are MRI safe. There's a really nice study that was published by uh, Johnson & Johnson a few years ago. And what was exciting there is that they were able to predict and get uh, predict the MRI heating that was occurring for a specific line of implants that they were about to uh, put out on the market. Using only modeling and simulation, they were able to get the MRI safety labeling for that, that line of devices. So really powerful in terms of what can be accomplished. The uh, last one is drug delivery. And then this kind of brings in pharma. I mean, we, did, we talked about medical devices in the title today and didn't talk about pharmaceuticals. We do a lot actually here at ANSYS in terms of pharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, but in this case, you know, I'll just highlight a couple of things and then wrap up. Um, you know, uh, first off, you know, the work that we do, as you can imagine, could be highly idealized. So we could look at things like uh, a human eye, a monkey eye, and a rabbit eye. These don't look very realistic at all. Um, the dimensions themselves are realistic. Um, but, you know, you, you can tell it's not quite organic, right? There's a lot of spherical objects and everything's nice and smooth and clean, okay? But we can use these types of models. They have great value in helping us to understand, for example, the drug delivery pattern from a device that's implanted inside the eye. And at least from the pharma in the pharmaceutical world, some of the questions they like to answer is, well, I'm already doing testing in a rabbit. Could I make a computational model that's predictive of what's happening in a rabbit, validate that, and then do kind of an extrapolation to the performance in humans? And not only that, do I get this uh, way to extrapolate what's gonna happen in humans, but maybe I can potentially reduce the testing that I'm doing in animals as well. Um, uh, you know, we can obviously op look at the devices themselves and see how they perform on their own. Um, some other work that I've done, this is a paper we published with the FDA back in uh, 2012, if I remember correctly. In this case, we were looking at drug delivery from a drug eluting stent and how that drug was dispersed into tissue. In this case, trying to figure out, you know, for different uh, tissue types, for different uh, formulations of drug and different, uh, you know, thermophysical, or no, sorry, um, chemical properties of the drug, you know, what does that mean for the absorption of that drug and tissue? Because one of the challenges we run into here, kind of like with the eye, is that we're only delivering that drug from the stent strut. So it's almost like a bunch of point sources that are touching the tissue. What does that mean for the overall dispersion of that drug in the tissue? Okay. And then finally, uh, drug delivery in the brain. So, you know, we can incorporate these more organic structures into our simulations as well. And this probably was supposed to be a video or I'm missing a picture, I apologize. Um, but we've done some work modeling that drug delivery pattern and what that looks like inside the brain. Um, so with that, I'll conclude. Yeah, um, I feel like I went a little bit over time and we wanna leave time for q and I'll just say from this slide, I can let you read the rest. Um, but what I'll say from this slide is that within the medical device industry, you know, I've mentioned a number of times, bench testing, animal testing, clinical trials. What we see now, and what I personally see as the future, and I think many, many folks agree with me, modeling and simulation is now the core, right? It can be the core. It can be that central source of evidence that brings together bench testing, animal testing, clinical trials. We're exchanging information between all these different sources of evidence, making all of them better. We're never, at least in the near future, getting rid of any of these. But if we can optimize the work that we're doing in those other three traditional sources of evidence through modeling and simulation, overall, then we see a huge opportunity to reduce the cost of bringing new medical devices to market and also reducing the animal testing and clinical trials that we're doing, but also reducing bench testing, which takes time. I think we all agree. So we really see an opportunity to work smarter and 
uh, with modeling and simulation sitting at the core of these other three sources of evidence, we think we can get there pretty quickly. So yeah, I went quickly. I guess one other thing, uh, Christina, maybe you can add it. As I mentioned, you know, if folks are interested in learning more about the VMV40 standard. Um, you know, one option is to join the VMV40 group. Uh, if you are interested in that, my email address is on the next slide. Uh, feel free to email me and then I can uh, get you signed up. Um, joining the ASME uh, standards development groups is free. They love it when you are a member of ASME, um, but it's not a requirement. So if you do see an opportunity there within your company um, to use modeling and simulation potentially as part of regulatory submissions, um, this is the place to learn. These are the experts who helped to develop the standard and are continuing to do new work uh, beyond the current standard that was um, already developed. Um, so feel free to reach out or reach out to me either directly or through LinkedIn or what have you and be happy to you know get you set up there. Great. Thank you so much, Mark, for your time and for leading this session today. It was very informative. You got it. My pleasure. Thanks okay. for inviting me, Christina. Of course. And thank you all for attending. We will see you at next week's Kitty Virtual Academy session.